Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this seventh week edition of the Bonavero Discussion Group. I'm Kate Regan, the director of the Bonavero Institute, and we're delighted today to welcome a visiting professor to the University of Oxford, Professor Errol Mendes, whose home base is the University of Ottawa. Errol is a distinguished Canadian constitutional lawyer with a long career, both in uh, constitutional and human rights scholarship, but also in practice. He's been an advisor to a wide range of governments, international organizations, and civil society organizations, and his interests have spanned across the field of constitutional law and human rights uh, into areas such as business and human rights, having been one of the people involved in establishing the Global Compact uh, back at the beginning of the millennium, um, as well as in more uh, sort of scholarly and uh, conceptual fields. Today, he's going to be talking about one of those, and that is the conception of sovereignty that underpins international law and international human rights law in particular. To respond and discuss the ideas that Professor Mendes is going to present, um, I'm delighted that our head of research, uh, Professor Taranab Kaitan, is here. Uh, Professor Kaitan is a distinguished constitutional lawyer in his own right, with a great interest both in legal theory as well as in constitutional law and practice. So this should be a really interesting conversation. Welcome to all of those uh, of you who are here. At this stage, I'm going to hand over to Professor Mendes. Thank him for being here. Looking forward to hearing what you're having to say, Errol. Thank you, Kate. And thank you very much to Arun and others at um, of the, the university for welcoming me. And I look forward to the discussion with everyone who is now on this webinar. Um, I'm showing you a picture of one of the most celebrated meetings in the history of modern history. Um, in 1648, you had one of the treaties signed at Westphalia, there were two, which essentially ended the Thirty Years' War in Europe. And it has been interpreted by some of the most renowned international lawyers, realist international relations scholars, and even some present and former state officials like Henry Kissinger, who even in, in his 91st year, is still waxing poetic about the Treaty of Westphalia and claiming that it established one of the foundational principles of international law and relations, namely that the principle of sovereignty means absolute autonomy within the territory boundaries of the state, and that such autonomy means there can be no limits on what those that claim to exercise the sovereign powers of this state can impose on their subjects within the territory. The late Fletcher School jurist, Leo Gross, writing in the American Journal of International Law, in 1948 asserted that the acceptance of the UN Charter in 1945 brought to mind its European predecessor, the Westphalia Treaties, as being one of the first several attempts in Europe, and then he claims ultimately the world, to establish unity on the basis of states exercising untrammeled sovereignty over certain territories, which could not be subject to any other earthly authority. Gross further asserts that the Peace of Westphalia was possibly the starting point of modern international law and also possibly the beginnings of what should be a form of international constitutional law. However, he then proceeds to point out that this legacy of the Peace of Westphalia was misinterpreted as establishing the principle of absolutist sovereignty. Other reputable scholars who have delved into the Westphalia treaties also claimed that this was a hugely inaccurate interpretation of the treaties. And they called for a re-examination of the real legacy of, of those treaties. I joined those ranks today and I claim sovereignty based on the enforceable rule of law in Europe, but it should also be regarded as one of the earliest major international treaties on human rights, focusing on religious rights that had enforcement mechanisms, even though, as history has shown, it was not perfect. So the question on those private plays, it actually established a form of international uses of adjudication. So the whole idea that has been given since Westphalia that uh, it created absolute, absolutist notions of sovereignty, uh, it's just false. Yeah, my apologies to everyone who's on this webinar. So I'm just going to repeat a um, couple of the things which um, may have been lost. So I was just referring to another uh, writer who basically pointed out that the actual wording of the treaties, again, 
uh, expressly limited state uh, absolute sovereignty of the signatories. So for example, David Croxton uh, essentially focused on the wording of the treaties and found out, for example, that the subjects of the new sovereigns um, had legal rights against their rulers, and in particular on religious rights and educational rights of the children. Um, he also pointed out, David Croxton, that one of the major parties to the Westphalia treaties, France, claimed that it had the right to intervention in the affairs of any of the other states to defend the fundamental laws granting subjects those religious rights. Now, this view that uh, France um, at that time actually thought it had intervention may be reminiscent of how certain states in the modern era have claimed the disputed right of humanitarian intervention to prevent atrocities by another state, such as against its own citizens. So my thesis is that the Westphalia Treaties did not establish the principle of absolute sovereignty. Unfortunately, since 1648, that concept has been exported to the rest of the world and is now most forcefully promoted by the authoritarian states in the world, like China. Sadly, however, some of the more, even modern international lawyers seem to go back to the founding architects of public international law in the 17th century to reaffirm that absolute sovereignty was uh, an outcome of the Westphalia Treaties and was therefore a foundational principle of international law. Often cite, for example, Hugo Grotius, writing in 1625, and I quote from his um, writing, that power, potestas, which he called, which is called sovereign, summa potestas, whose actions are not subject to the legal control of another, is such they cannot be rendered void by the operation of another human will. But if you look at the wording of the treaties again, the Peace of Westphalia made the princess subject to legal control by the imperial courts and subject even to a pledge by France and Sweden that they could enforce the constitutional provisions of the treaties. So my thesis is that the, the true legacy of the uh, Westphalia treaties was that sovereignty under the rule of law in Europe at that time was not absolute and could be contingent both externally and internally. Um, sadly, again, what some of the uh, modern uh, proponents of uh, public international law keep on referring to Hugo Grotius, forgetting that other uh, architects of public international law after Grotius, such as Jean Brodin in the 16th century, who, yes, defined sovereignty as absolute and perpetual power. And another uh, major architect of in international law, Imad de Patel, the great advocate for sovereign equality and non-intervention, who was writing in 1758. However, even he and uh, Brodin basically said that there was no prince in the world which is not subject to the fundamental laws of society endorsed constitutions or nature and could give his subjects lawful cause for revolting by his tyranny. Moving to modern times, likewise, the, in the legendary jurist Lasse Oppenheim, in his landmark text in 1905 titled International Law, asserted, and I quote, state sovereignty has become conditional to recognition by other sovereign states and a subsequent membership in the family of nations. He called this conditional membership in the family of nations involved a contradiction. A sovereign state must act in a dignified manner. It must use sovereignty with restraint by respecting the human rights and fundamental freedoms of its citizens. So again, uh, my thesis has been echoed in the past, but often forgotten by some of the major proponents of the, uh, the Peace of Westphalia as being um, the foundation of public international law and indeed ultimately a form of domestic law as giving absolute types of power to those who rule countries. Leo Gross uh, concludes that this misinterpretation of the Peace of Westphalia led to an era of absolutist states in Europe who were jealous of their ter territory. He continued that they were more concerned with the preservation and expansion of their power than with the establishment of a rule of law. He continued that in the 19th century, after the Napoleonic Wars and the Congress and Consulate of Europe, this misinterpretation of Westphalia continued to lead to the absolutist notions of sovereignty, which unfortunately started becoming entrenched in the Hague Peaks Conferences, the League of Nations, and ultimately, as I will discuss, in the UN Charter, which entrenched this weak aspect of global governance 
which is not bound by an international rule of law. Now, in my book on global governance, and I'm here in Oxford in part to um, uh, do a second edition of the book, um, I assert that the correct interpretation of the legacy of, of the Peace of Westphalia should be that it was supposed to be about the legitimation of the exercise of sovereign power with limitations on how that power can be exercised against their own subjects or indeed against other states. The sovereignty of the Peace of Westphalia was never intended to be an absolute power that includes, for example, the right to brutalize their subjects, as many authoritarian governments claim today. Now, this view is also supported by other writers who I'm glad that has uh, the same approach that I have. For example, Jean Cohen, who argues that global legal development has led to a new political culture of sovereignty, namely from one from impunity to one from reconciliation and accountability. Now, the horrors of the colonial period including slavery, the two world wars, and the Holocaust were key catalysts for the modern global human rights system, and indeed civil society movements that urges and seeks to mandate the respect for the fundamental rights of subjects in sovereign states. But sadly, the framers of the UN Charter seem to revert back to the absolutist concept of sovereign power. It is not really well known, and in, in my, my own students when I teach in this area were very surprised, to find out that the first draft of the UN Charter at Dumbarton Oaks in 1944 hardly contained any substantial provisions on human rights. It was only because of the storm of criticism from civil society and middle powers who, who were left out and it was, there was an attempt to leave them out by the great powers who wanted to have a self-interested interested, interested structure uh, without such rights protection that eventually led to them finally agreeing to have only what I call hortatory and aspirational language on human rights in the final version of the UN Charter, rather than the use of strong legal language. In contrast, the final version of the UN Charter did entrench absolutist forms of sovereignty written in the clearest legal language. Article 1 and Article 2.4 of the Charter makes territorial integrity, political independence of the nation state, and non-interference as the principal condition of peace and security, subject only to the powers of the Security Council. That body's duty was to enforce such a global governance system. But sadly, what we see today is that some of the key five permanent members will guarantee not only the absolutist forms of sovereignty of their allies, but also their own, even if it involves the worst atrocities and genocides against their own subjects or against their allies or those of their allies. Indeed, this system of protecting the absolutist forms of sovereignty, in my view, showed its tragic flaw in the UN Charter early on when the Security Council failed to do anything in the first genocide of the 20th century in East Timor by the state of Indonesia, which in my view set the stage for the inactions which led to the genocidal horrors we've seen in the Balkans and Rwanda. However, and here's the, the optimistic part of my presentation. It is in fractured societies that seek to remain democratic that may trigger finally the democratic world at least to demand an, a re-examination of who and what is entitled to exercise any absolutist forms of sovereignty and the related issue of whether to refuse the diplomatic and legal recognition of oppressive governments that claim to exercise sovereign powers, but keep on oppressing their own subjects and committing atrocities, for example, against them. The two of, uh, of the legal notion of sovereignty and also the, the notion of recognition, the two are linked. Ilau Ladapak, a leading exponent of public international law in the modern era, stressed that sovereignty is, however, more commonly used in a second meaning, describing the jurisdiction and control that those who control power in a state may exercise. Now, while the granting of legal recognition of governments by other countries uh, is often based on the criterion of effectiveness, for example, control over a major part of the territory, habitual obedience of a majority of the population, and perhaps a reasonable aspect of permanence, commentators like Cambridge jurist Frederica Padau has suggested, and I quote, there is a sort of mesh, M-E-S-H, is emerging from a relationship between effectiveness and legitimacy. 
which determines the likelihood of recognition by other countries. She and I state that present examples in recent history shows that a failure to demonstrate such democratic legitimacy could become a form of custom against recognition of oppressive de facto governments by major parts of the international community, and especially regarding the right of such governments to exercise the sovereign powers of the country. Both uh, Federico Padau and I give examples of non-recognition of oppressive de facto governments, such as Haiti in the 1991-1994 period, Sierra Leone in 1998, Ivory Coast in 2011, and the Gambia in 2017, when much of the international community sided with the ousted and legitimate governments that, that even though those who got control uh, had effective control of the country, nevertheless, the goal of the rest of the international community was to seek to restore democracy against the illegitimate government. Now, to me, the most pressing situation today that demands the refusal to extend recognition to a government that seeks to exercise the country's sovereign powers, but at the same time is committing atrocities against their own citizens, is what is happening in Myanmar with the military junta there. And this is where I now turn to an example of where I think the legacy of the Peace of Westphalia should require a different approach to a country like Myanmar. Now, in, in a report which I and others helped to draft, an NGO, Fortify Rights, working with the opposition national unity government, which I'll talk about more in a minute, are asserting that the atrocities which have been committed by the junta should be brought before the International Criminal Court by what it considers the government in exile. And the NUG, the national unity government, should be regarded as a legitimate body to trigger this process. Now, um, a, a word about who this national unity government uh, consists of. They are pr primarily the, the top civilian and political leaders who actually were usually elected before the, the junta took over. And for example, it includes the acting president, the prime minister, and 70% of the cabinet, some of whom are still working inside the country, but obviously um, in secret. Now, the argument of fortify rights can be seen in the following extracts from the report, which I will try to share screen to show you why it is particularly important in, in, at this time for uh, essentially uh, the, the, um, uh, the international community to look at, at what is happening in, in Myanmar and think about applying a different approach to sovereignty in a country like that. So this, uh, this report, which I'm showing you, uh, which is titled Ending Impunity in Myanmar, uh, is focused on whether or not this government in exile, some of whom are still in the country, can actually claim to exercise sovereign powers and try and seek the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court to try the atrocities committed by the, the military. Um, I'm going to quickly go through some of the, um, the, um, uh, the basic um, uh, atrocities that the, the, the uh, the government, the uh, hunter has committed. Um, I don't, I'm going to spare you some of the worst um, atrocities because I think it's it's really uh, um, stunning at, at the level in which this impunity is taking place. So the the military overthrew um, the elected government by a coup d'état on February the first, 2021, and they arrested most of the senior elected leaders and the and the civilian leaders. But however. Uh, enough of them uh, managed to escape to form this uh, government in exile, the national unity government. The people of Myanmar have protested this and have started various nonviolent tactics uh, and a civil disobedience mov movement that includes not reporting to work, which has basically brought the country and, and indeed uh, the government to a halt. However, the military and the the police have responded to the peaceful protests by deadly force, by murdering and arresting civilians en masse throughout the country. They've used forced labor, they've raided and destroyed property, they've blocked uh, and restricted internet access, they've attacked healthcare centers, and in uh, what latest reports I've heard, they're even engaging in starvation tactics to, to suppress the rebellion. Um, they've killed more than 900 men, women, and children uh, at the time of this report. Uh, between February and April of this year, but I'm, I hear that those numbers are rapidly increasing. And it is something which they have practiced in the past too. Uh, they have perpetrated similar atrocities in the past throughout the country, focusing primarily on the ethnic states, 
and have affected millions of people, forcibly displacing um, them, especially along Myanmar's borders. They've raised thousands of ethnic villages throughout the country and killed unknown numbers of men, women, and children. And, and the, the area which I, would, I don't want to talk about is the worst aspects of these atrocities. They've engaged in the most horrible forms of systemic rape and sexual violence against women and girls, as well as men and boys. And most of this is being done with impunity. So the question then becomes, can um, the international community working with the government in exile uh, start a process of, of seeking um, uh, prosecution of the present junta? Uh, or is the so-called absolutist notion of sovereignty going to stand in his way? Well, in my view, I think that ultimately, under international law, there should be a way for the government in exile uh, to argue that it is the, rep the authoritative government and can represent and act on behalf of Myanmar. The fact that the junta is ex ex exerting control by violence and force doesn't mean to say that it should have exclusive jurisdiction to represent the country. And I've used the examples of Haiti and Sierra Leone and others to perhaps use them as an example that the international community should re-examine what sovereignty means in this concept and try and give some leeway to the government in exile to represent uh, the people and, and the sovereignty of Myanmar. Just to give you an example of how this uh, government in exile has received support, um, they have engaged in many high level meetings with representatives of the governments of the US, the UK, Japan, France, Ireland, Venezuela, the European Union, and on June the 30th of this year, 150 senators from France signed a resolution to recognize the government in exile as the official government of Myanmar. Indeed, the special rapporteur for Myanmar, Thomas Andrews, has also recognized the right of the, the, the national unity government to represent the sovereign powers of Myanmar. In fact, in a statement to the UN Human Rights Council on June, July the 7th of this year, he urged member states that the national unity government deserves to be embraced. Why? Because they were laying the groundwork for a unified Myanmar, which include welcoming back the Rohingya uh, uh, ethnic minorities who have been basically the subject of a genocide by the military. And it is also trying that this government in exile is trying to essentially coordinate humanitarian assistance into the country and is now committed to ensuring international justice and accountability for the victims of the crimes of, of the junta. Now, Fortify Rights and I have, have suggested that they have two options to use the potential for use their sovereign powers to accede to the International Criminal Court. The first one is essentially to, to lodge what's called a declaration on the Article 12 sub 3 of the Rome Statute to specify what areas of crimes that the court could look over. The second option is to accede formally to the Rome Statute, which involves a much more complicated procedure, such as depositing the instrument of accession with the UN Secretary General, and basically who would then seek advice from other uh, uh, countries and the General Assembly. Um, and even if accession is successful at the UN, there's a chance that a state party in the assembly of, of, of state parties to the Rome Statute, which establishes the court, could challenge the validity. So that's why my advice has been to start perhaps with lodging a declaration on the Article 12 sub 3, which states that Myanmar accedes to the jurisdiction of the court and the success depends on just the, the acceptance of the declaration by the register of the court, who then transmits it to the office of the prosecutor for further consideration and possible jurisdictional hearing before the trial court. Now this was done with, with Palestine and I was there in, at the International Criminal Court during that process when everyone thought this would never happen and it did. So a declaration by this government in exile under Article 12 sub 3 could actually specify um, the jurisdiction of the court to cover all the, the atrocity crimes which have been committed in present, but also potentially allow the court to look at all the crimes going right back to 2002, when the court was established by the Rome Statute, which could include genocide being committed against the Rohingya. If this type of the exercise of sovereign power by the government in exile was accepted, I suggest it would be a modern day legacy of the peace of Westphalia, as properly interpreted. 
It should represent a modern day concept of legal sovereignty that affords the state personality in international law. But it also denies that this confers absolute autonomy on those who govern without interference if it commits international crimes against its own people. In my view, and I will close with this, recognition of this government in exile to start this process would be to recognize a form of what I call oppositional sovereignty within a country that could and should be recognized as a growing practice in international and constitutional law. At the time of, of this lecture, a similar situation is arising in Sudan, which also has a military usurping power, even though it too has been involved in the most serious crimes, including genocide. And there I mentioned Belarus, where some would argue that the same thing is happening there. So in conclusion, I argue, I argue that democratic states should consider recognizing the sovereignty of the people of Myanmar as represented by the government in exile and support their desire to accede to the jurisdiction of the court through article sub three of the Rome Statute, thereby being an example of the proper and true legacy of the period. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Errol, for a very provocative and thought-provoking presentation. I'm going to turn, I suggest again that you try turning off your screen, even if it means we lose you for five seconds, but I think it might produce better um, audibility for the audience. And um, I'm now going to turn to Taran to speak for 10 to 15 minutes, and I will also turn off my screen to try and preserve bandwidth. Thanks, Taran. Thanks very much, Kate, and, and Errol, thank you very much for, um, for talking to us. And, and giving us this excellent presentation. Um, I was going to start with an apology for, for, for commenting, uh, despite not being an international lawyer. But now I think that I should not apologize. In fact, um, congratulate the, the Bonavero team uh, for organizing this conversation because international law and constitutional law uh, clearly often deal with very similar topics um, and related concerns and still we have siloed our disciplines in ways that we don't talk nearly as much as we should be talking. So, so I feel very grateful for, for uh, commenting uh, on your presentation. I should also uh, say that I haven't uh, had the chance yet to read your book. So some of the comments and criticisms um, may well be based on uh, on ignorance of the larger project. So this is this is simply based on your current presentation. Uh, with, you know, as a constitutional lawyer, I mean, largely in sympathy uh, with it. But uh, here are some thoughts. Um, so first, um, I was a bit surprised by the the, the, the manner in which you engage with the Westphalia Treaty's interpretation. And this may well be uh, because of this role uh, that uh, scholars have in international law. Uh, and, you know, this is, this is basically a jealous constitutional lawyer speaking. But it was interesting that almost all of your evidence in, 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 in challenging the conventional interpretation of the Westphalian Treaty was uh, to, to cite views of scholars both contemporaneous and uh, or prior to the treaty and, and subsequently until the present date. And, um, and that, that methodology was very interesting to me because you know it will get us absolutely nowhere in constitutional law. Um, and I was just wondering why, uh, you know, is this a disciplinary thing? I would have expected, uh, you know, from my discipline for you to pick out the text of the treaties uh, of Westphalia and show, you know, this is the provision that has been wrongly interpreted, this is what it should mean, et cetera. So put, put more pressure uh, through the text rather than through scholarly opinion. Um, but anyway, as, as I say, that, that, is, that could largely just be my, my disciplinary ignorance. So um, the next point I want to make is, um, is hearing your presentation from, from a global South lens. There's sort of two conflicting uh, 
immediate thoughts come to mind. The first is that the treaties, as far as I am aware, um, the Western Peace Treaties have extremely parochial European roots. They were signed to, uh, to solve very contextual European problems. Um, and most of the rest of the world uh, did not sign up to them. So I'm, I'm curious about their legal status in international law today and and how does that come about is there is there a later process of translation as you mentioned perhaps through the un charter or the, uh, two or through other measures that the other countries just signed up to it or is it just that uh, you know your uh, international law has such deeply entrenched european roots that uh, that is just assumed that that this is the beginning of the concept of sovereignty in international law as it exists in other countries, just have to take it or leave it. Well, they can't really leave it. Um, so I'm just wondering, uh, how is it that, that that this very particular European idea becomes international? Is that a historical process or is it just an assumption in international law? On the other side of the post-colonial anxiety is, um, is that following at least political decolonization, you know, one of the implications of your argument would be a much more permissive and interventionist international law, um, which would result in deeply uh, anxious, uh, I suspect, um, uh, worries on the part of at least some countries in the global south. And now this is not a normative concern for me uh, necessarily because uh, a lot of these countries um, perhaps are, um, uh, committing crimes against their own populations and use sovereignty as a shield, but uh, but to the extent that global power dynamics uh, that existed during colonialism continue to have uh, lingering legacies, and that intervention usually works in the uh, in favor of powerful states or or for uh, geopolitical reasons, I'm just wondering what kind of response would you have for for countries in the global south who actually might want to insist on a on a on a stronger, uh, more absolutist notion of sovereignty, because um, any exceptions will be abused, misused uh, by by the stronger states against against the weaker ones. The next point I want to uh, raise. So again, I, I was just quickly looking at the text of the UN Charter, Article Two Four, etc. And, you know, I'm not in national law, and I'm sure there's a there's a wealth of literature on uh, on its interpretation. Um, but I, I was just curious about you know its its scope. Really, is about forbidding the use of force, and at least your idea of oppositional sovereignty, which I'll come to because I, I'm just extremely interested in that, as as you've discussed previously. Um, that does not seem to me to be uh, an example of use of force. So it seems to me that it's entirely compatible with, uh, with Article 2.4 of the Charter. And, and perhaps there is some textual uh, room in the Charter itself to, to recognize that, that, uh, that, that sovereignty, the idea of sovereignty in the Charter is not absolutist after all. Um, and again, use of force against whom? Because even sort of criminal prosecution of certain leaders uh, who commit atrocities. I don't know, when does the use of force against individual citizens of a state translate into use of force against the state? Uh, I certainly think there is a conceptual gap between the two and that one could at least uh, conceptually think that use of force against individuals is not the same thing as the use of force against the state or indeed um, the people. My uh, next query is, about uh, the Rome Statute exception. So if I understood your argument clearly, um, the idea was that the, the scope of the Rome Statute should not necessarily just uh, remain restricted to its signatory member states. And I'm just wondering, you know, uh, from my undergraduate days, I have echoes of ideas like customary international law. And I'm just thinking, you know, um, surely that is just a, um, a simple development of an idea of, of a norm in international law becoming a customary norm uh, as and when that happens through state practice and 
uh, in precedence, etc., whatever the requirements of customary international law. So is this really such a radical idea conceptually? Uh, you know, surely um, other exceptions to state sovereignty, perhaps humanitarian intervention, etc., um, have been recognized because of the development of customary international law. So, uh, so do we really need such a broadside challenge to the idea of sovereignty itself to to recognize what is arguably uh, a relatively um, small exception, or at least it seems to me, I'm sure that it's politically very uh, complicated, but a conceptually quite a small exception that people, leaders who commit uh, crimes against humanity, et cetera, should be, should be tried uh, under international law. The final point, uh, I want to raise, and sorry, this is sort of a shooting ducks approach to discuss, <laughs> discussions where I'm throwing a ton of questions at you and honestly feel free to ignore uh, most or any of them. Uh, the final point I just want to develop, and this is probably my only uh, contribution uh, rather than simply a question, which is uh, just drawing an analogy with constitutional law and thinking about uh, the idea of oppositional sovereignty. Where um, I'm thinking about the different entities uh, who might be relevant in thinking about, in, in considering sovereignty rights. So we we have the state, its people, uh, its government, uh, its parties, political parties. Now it seems to me that there is uh, a gap between uh, two different entities. Um, on the one hand, we need to know. Uh, who, who, who does sovereignty vest in, right? So who, uh, at least the language of the UN Charter suggests that it's the people. Um, but I, anyway, I, I don't know the answer to that, but that question seems to me to be a distinct question from the second question, which is who gets to exercise sovereignty on behalf of whoever it is that sovereignty vests in. Um, and once, once you put pressure on that, gap between who, uh, you know, uh, who, in whom sovereignty vests and who exercises it, it seems to me that it's a lot easier to get to your idea of oppositional sovereignty. In fact, you know, I, there's a short blog post I'm posting uh, here, which might be interesting, uh, exploring a very similar idea in a particular context of, of sovereignty. But I think if that is right, if, uh, if you think that sovereignty vests in the people, but can be exercised not just by the government of the day, but but is shared in its exercise by uh, by a group which can legitimately cl lay claim to representing the people or parts thereof. Right. So the government and the opposition parties, or governments in exile, etc. Right? So that the the people who get to exercise sovereignty are not just a unitary entity, but um, but all those groups who together can legitimately claim to exercise parts of the people. Once you make that move, then your suggestion is not a small um, uh, conceptual exception carved out for international crimes, but is a much broader um, challenge to the idea of who exercises sovereignty and its implications uh, go far beyond Myanmar. Right? So it, it will apply to all countries uh, in all international negotiations, um, international treaty making. Uh, so who represents a sovereign people? You know, uh, so the blog post, for example, talks about the right of the political opposition in uh, a, to attend international, to have a seat at the table in international negotiations alongside the government of the day. Right? So I'm just wondering whether you're comfortable with, uh, with that much uh, stronger, much more powerful, um, a challenge to uh, to the to sovereignty in thinking about opposition sovereignty, or or, or I, do you want to confine your challenge uh, to a narrower um, scope of of exceptions to to international uh, crimes, in, in which conceptual route would be better in getting there? So the first being development of customary international law to recognize. Uh, a, an international crime-based exception to sovereignty or, or a much more general development of the idea of the gap between 
sovereignty vesting in one entity and being exercised by another. Getting rid of my video just to make sure that we have uh, uh, better bandwidth on this. Um, good good uh, questions, uh, um, Tarun. So let me go through them uh, briefly. In terms of the impact and what's the relevance of the West Treaty of Westphalia, um, it absolutely has no legal um, uh, relevance after 19, 6, 1648. However, as with so many things, once um, a concept has been uh, established, even if it is inaccurate, it has legs. And it continued all the way through, as uh, Leo Gross has shown, not just from 1648, but in, into the 17th century, into the 18th century, into the 19th century, from you know, the concept of Europe, right into uh, the Hague Peace Conferences, the League of Nations. And uh, my view is that that misconception was the result of the, uh, the use of the, what I call the absolutist language in, in, in the UN Charter. Now, in terms of um, uh, the, uh, the thesis being used as a way of, of uh, use of force against others. No, that's not what I'm focusing on. I think the whole thesis is that if we can establish that sovereignty is not absolute, but is both um, internally and external, externally limited based on, or, on what is happening within the country, suddenly then you have the potential and goes, this goes into your other um, uh, areas that you've mentioned, how can you develop uh, forms of oppositional sovereignty which allows uh, countries like Myanmar, uh, and perhaps now you're seeing it in Sudan, and you're seeing it now in Belarus and potentially other countries, how do you, how do you get um, a, a type of, of, of focus on shared sovereignty or oppositional sovereignty which allows uh, the rest of the democratic world, and I emphasize democratic world, there's no possibility that China or Russia is ever going to accept anything I've said, but I'm focusing my thesis on the democratic world and I'm focusing it on the liberal democratic world because sadly, even a country like uh, Hungary may not agree with everything I've said. So um, if, if what I'm suggesting could start uh, being accepted by some of the democratic world, certainly you then have the ability of countries uh, like the UK, like my own country, Canada, and other democrat, liberal democratic states to say, we are going to accept this concept of oppositional sovereignty and we're gonna work with the opposition to actually try and help them achieve ultimately um, uh, the re restoration of democracy in their countries with uh, protections of fundamental human rights as happened in Haiti, as happened in Sierra Leone, as happened in all these other countries. Uh, however, there hasn't been a sufficient discussion from those um, events as to whether there should be a re-examination of the whole concept of sovereignty and those who exercise it. So it's not just focusing on the concept of sovereignty, but who has the ability to exercise the sovereign powers of a country. And if certain conditions start arising, then yes, you then have the potential for oppositional sovereignty to arise. And um, it has immense significance to the South because, well, Myanmar is just one of the countries in the South, but it's, it, it's clearly there in many other countries, certainly in Africa, um, certainly in other parts of Asia too, where again, there could be this type of, of a proportion, a, a proposition of a form of oppositional sovereignty, which the rest of the democratic world can work with. So yes, it has immense significance um, across not just uh, use of force or international crimes, but um, in, in other aspects too. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's going to take some time um, and we'll see what happens in Myanmar or Sudan or Belarus or a bunch of other countries where what I'm proposing in a way is being tested. Are you still there, Errol? Have you got further comments you want to make? Yes, no, I'm still there. So I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to see if uh, either Tarun or anyone else in the webinar has um, questions well, or... I mean, I'm not sure if there's anything further you want to say into, in relation to Tarun, but I just would like to, um, to to put a question as well, somewhat related to Tarun's, and also just to remind those in the audience, if they'd like to put a question, please um, go ahead. And, and, th and that is to put a sort of sceptical concern, which links to the one of the ones that uh, Tarun put, which is that if we think of the world of geopolitics, um, is not introducing conceptions of a kind of lesser form of sovereignty or oppositional sovereignty only going to play in 
potentially to quite perverse forms of geopolitics, um, which may, uh, I mean, I'm struck by the fact that commentators on African constitutions in the kind of immediate post-colonial period emphasize how every single African constitution asserts sovereignty in its first provision. For the post-colonial states, the sense of sovereignty was very important and it was important precisely because of the perverse responses to, um, to those societies during the colonial period. So is there not a real risk that actually something like this may actually have some very perverse consequences? That's the first question. And the second one is to say, I understand the argument about wanting to um, uh, ensure kind of that uh, gross human rights violations find their way, way before uh, international the International Criminal Court. But is this the best mechanism for that? Are, are we not, you know, is, is there, are there not ways to ensure that that happens without potentially uh, creating, as it were, kind of perverse consequences around, um, around uh, sovereignty? And that this in, in some ways is a pretty narrow focus that you're wanting to deal with. It's really to ensure uh, that gross human rights violations or international crimes are dealt with by, um, by the International Criminal Court. In some ways, it's a standing question. And should we be tampering with, uh, albeit, I'm gonna completely buy the historical argument, the flawed historical conception of sovereignty to achieve that? So that's the second one. And my third one is that, I mean, going back to my uh, kind of early international law uh, training is that there's a mix between, there's in sovereignty between fact and law. In other words, sovereignty is sort of made up of not only that you are entitled uh, to be the exercising sovereignty in relation to a state, but that you can. And I just wondered, you, you seem to slide, emphasize particularly the former and not the latter. Um, and is there not really a real practical certainty reason for having elements of the factual ability to exercise sovereignty as part of the test for sovereignty? Excellent questions, uh, Kate, and I'm going to try and address them. First of all, I actually agree with your first comment that there is a danger. There is a danger, and it was clearly um, uh, evidenced by what happened with um, uh, the illegal invasion in Iraq uh, by the U.S. So absolutely, I agree with you that it has to be looked at very, very carefully and not be used the way it was used, for example, um, uh, by the U.S. in Iraq. Absolutely. But that's where I tend to focus not on the actions of the major powers um, in, in countries like Myanmar and Belarus and Sudan, but uh, in countries where um, the, essentially you're seeing the, the, the claim for this type of opposition, uh, oppositional sovereignty coming from within the country. And so I would limit it only. I mean, in, in some respects, that actually happened in South Africa, your, 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 your home country. So, I mean, just to, and, and, and think about uh, how, to some extent, the, the ultimate uh, resolution of that would not have happened if countries like my own country, Canada, and, and uh, despite the opposition of a certain prime minister in, in this country, um, and nevertheless, um, uh, the, the result was that the oppositional sovereignty became successful. Um, however, um, your second part of your question is, again, excellent, and, and as someone who, who likes to have very precise um, uh, study and focus on, on, on international law, you're absolutely right that um, there are jurists, um, the, the most famous ones is obviously uh, Hans Kelsen, but also a more modern uh, jurist, um, Schmidt, who basically would basically dismiss my thesis by saying, at the end result, Professor Mendez, you may say that, that there's a right of oppositional sovereignty, but when, when push comes to shove, uh, everyone re uh, relies on who has the force to actually establish, um, uh, uh, to resolve a crisis. So Schmidt, for example, would say sovereignty is all about the use of force and the use of, of the ability to actually achieve. I don't agree with that because we've seen what the use of force has done in many countries around the world. So it's basically, um, uh, in some respects, what is happening now is, um, is jurists like um, like Jean, uh, Jean Cohen, uh, myself and others are teamed up against those who would rubbish everything I say by basically saying, uh, it's, it's good that you come up with these theories, but I would love to see you, Errol, what would happen in a country where you, you, you would say you support the oppositional sovereignty, but in a crisis, you always rely on the f use of force, the military, et cetera, to achieve whatever crisis uh, 
is facing the country. So absolutely, these are real world issues which we have to face. Great. Well, thanks very much. So I'm going to pick up one of the questions that's come or the question that's come in from the audience and just encourage other people to ask. Um, so this is from one of the postdocs uh, at the Bavatnik School of Government. And the question is, there seems to be a divide among scholars of international law as to whether sovereignty is a principle which animates specific rules, for example, the prohibition on the use of force, or whether it's a rule in its own right. And uh, the questioner would be interested to hear about what you make of the debate about the question as to whether sovereignty is a principle or a rule and how it might bear on the argument that you've made today um, about oppositional sovereignty. Yeah, excellent question again, because uh, one of the problems I have with the Treaty of Westphalia and what happened since then is that issue was never fully discussed. Uh, in, in, to, to some extent, uh, the, the idea that um, sovereignty would establish um, absolute powers within a territory uh, ignored that question as to what type of powers are you talking about? And so uh, ultimately there was a hope at some stage, especially um, as I mentioned, uh, the first uh, version of the UN Charter, there was a hope, uh, especially by the middle powers and civil society, that those issues would be sorted out. Um, because they were still the carry through from Westphalia into the Hague Peace Conferences, to the League of Nations, to essentially um, the, the, the creation of the UN. But at Dumbarton Oaks, that was ignored. And so basically, uh, all that happened was a, a focus on, well, how do we structure the actual institutions of the, of the UN? And as you know, the great powers essentially try to uh, essentially make it uh, just their um, uh, UN Charter by focusing entirely on their powers and ignored actually what the middle powers were trying to say. So that those questions never arose. And that's why now I think it's, it's, it's really important for scholars and practitioners to say, well, maybe there should be a division between what exactly sovereignty means. Um, does it mean um, basically uh, the traditional approach to international law is that once you have sovereignty, you have legal personality international law, or does it mean something else? Does it mean that you have a unified sovereignty within a country, or do you have divided sovereignty within a country? Uh, one area which I was expecting maybe Tarun to, to, to ask is how does this apply to secessionist movements, which again is a form of oppositional sovereignty? Um, and I was glad you didn't ask the question because I'm not sure that I want to answer that question right now because it even raises even bigger questions of who is the nation? And as you know, that's very relevant now to the United Kingdom. So absolutely, uh, the question that you asked, Kate, was uh, extremely important, but unfortunately, and again, maybe your, 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 your DFIL um, uh, person could focus on that and come up with possible solutions to that um, unanswered um, question. Great, and I see that Taran's got his hand up. Taran, there's something you want to supplement here. Only if you have time, Kate. Yes, yes, I think we do. No, no other yes. questions pending. Um, El, uh, so I was just wondering maybe, um, one way to, to engage and deal with, respond to some of Kate's questions is to think about the different um, facets of sovereignty differently um, and, and perhaps to suggest that the op idea of opposition sovereignty applies to some, but not all of those facets, right? So um, I'm just thinking aloud and maybe this work has been done by international scholars, right? There's, one one key idea is uh, sort of non-aggression, right? So no no external use of force. Um, a, a second aspect of sovereignty appears to be sort of legal personality in international affairs. Sort of you know who gets to talk to other nations, who gets to sign treaties on behalf of the people and state, etc. Um, a, a third seems to me uh, to be sort of you know. Um, uh, organizing its own internal affairs uh, in the manner that you like uh, and, and things like that. And, and I'm just wondering that, you know, just uh, mapping mapping these different facets of sovereignty out and, and then asking where, if anywhere, the oppositional idea of sovereignty is relevant uh, may be a way out of uh, overkill of the sort that Kate is worried about, right? So, so to me, um, sort of uh, applying opposition sovereignty to the idea of legal personality in international affairs 
is less problematic. And in fact, I think that, you know, not just the Sudans and the Myanmar's of the world, but all democratic states should practice it by inviting their opposition parties to international meetings. Um, on the other hand, you know, when, you, when, when it comes to use of force, uh, I think there's a lot of anxiety, uh, post-colonial anxiety about e extending it, uh, sort of thinking about holes in the idea of sovereignty. So I'm just wondering whether that might be a more promising approach instead of thinking about sovereignty as this single uh, unitary black box to just break it down into its constituents and apply oppositional sovereignty to one of those features alone. And which will obviously be relevant to uh, you know, the self-determination and secession question as well. Uh, again, uh, excellent uh, questions. And um, as we're almost going to the end of time, let me go back on, on, on video. Um, uh, one reason why I decided not to go to that broader area where, for example, they include, for example, in India, for example, should they be um, um, uh, sovereignty attached to the, the people who are opposing what is increasingly becoming uh, a Hindu-dominated government. Um, that triggers a whole bunch of other issues, immense political issues, et cetera. The reason why I focus primarily in, in the Myanmar type situation or the Sudan type situation is that you're more likely to get, even if, and um, I, I, was, I was hesitant to say this, even if, for example, um, the International Criminal Court um, takes too long to accept uh, Myanmar's jurisdiction, the fact that it actually is a potential um, exercise of oppositional sovereignty by the government in exile could trigger a, a, a very important response by the democratic world to help the government in exile to move further along in terms of humanitarian assistance, to basically help them in terms of um, essentially uh, the refugee process uh, problems that could happen. So in other words, there's a spin-off effect in terms of the democratic world helping uh, that type of oppositional sovereignty, which is desperately needed. My God, um, uh, if you look again, the same thing is happening in Belarus, same thing is happening in Sudan. And uh, what I'm trying to do is to come up with, with ideas which can be the beginnings of a longer process. It, it could take many years, ultimately for, for example, the uh, government in exile uh, to actually achieve what I'm suggesting, uh, primarily because, and uh, the latest I've heard, is that Russia and China are fully backing the junta. So the, the prospects of the, the, the government in exile getting uh, anywhere soon is, is remote. It could take many years, maybe decades. Um, so that's why I'm focusing on this area as opposed to the larger area that you suggested, which triggers, especially in the area of secession, um, immense political questions. Great. Well, thanks very much, Errol. Anything further from you, Taryn? Are you... And a, a really very a provocative and interesting um, idea, um, Errol, that I think has made us all think a lot. Thank you very much uh, for, for the presentation and to Taryn for stepping in as a constitutional lawyer to, to think about these questions. Um, uh, thanks to everybody who's attended. I just want to remind um, those of you who are here that there will be several other events before the end of term. So one is a, a discussion tomorrow on uh, rethinking agency and international human rights and particularly international children's law on, uh, on child marriage as a choice. And that will be uh, presented by Dr. Hoko Horil and you will pick up the in, um, uh, reference to it on our website. And then on also tomorrow afternoon, there'll be a book launch on collective access to justice, assessing the potential of class actions in England and Wales. This is the product of one of the research projects that's been run at the Bonavera after the last few, over the last few years. The book is by our postdoctoral researcher, Dr. Michael Malavi, and the panelists will be Andrew Higgins, Joe Tomlinson, Suzanne Kyoto, and Duncan Fairgreave. And then finally, the last um, uh, edition, as it were, the discussion group next Tuesday, uh, will be considering the question, why do so many movements for police reform fail? What are the structural ob obstacles to democratic policing? That will be presented by Professor Chris Stone from the Blavatnik School of Government and responded to by uh, Johnny Steinberg, the South African author who's written extensively on policing in South Africa. So if those of you who are interested in policing, please do join us next week. Thanks very much again, Errol and Taran, for a great conversation. And thanks to all of you for attending um, and hope to be able to see some of you in person soon. Bye now. <laughs>